Excited to have you all back to this, our 270th show of ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And you, Eric, who runs us, our producer, please tell us which accumulated viewer you are who is watching us now. Hey, Martin. Uh, the Humane Architecture viewer is up to 14,590. <laughs> okay, keep that up, viewing us. And us is our... Three from the filling station here, or the triumvirate with uh, DeSoto Brown, uh, Bishop Museum historian in his Bishop Museum. Hi, DeSoto. <laughs> good morning, good day. Our uh, Boston Banish booster, Matt Noblet, however, today from Detroit, Michigan. Hi, Matt. Good, uh, yeah, good evening. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, on the other end of that mainland and me martin despang from the grand waikiki grand hotel that is easy breezy but since we're still having these rowdy combustion engines i'm gonna i'm as inside as we all are but uh, with this first slide up here we should be we want to be all outside and hopefully this is where we're continuously moving uh talking moving since you're in Detroit and you have become our foreign co correspondent, Matt. Uh, <laughs> can you give us a little bit of um, your your sort of synopsis of having been back to Detroit? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think in many ways it's encouraging to see quite a bit of construction activity. I mean, I'm looking out at a skyline with quite a few cranes on it and um, certainly uh, sort of hotel and nightlife opportunities are are are, are back and um, and quite lively, but uh, you know it's it it is still very much a city uh, kind of a post industrial uh, urban landscape, meaning there's a lot of empty lots and there's just not a lot of life uh, kind of public life on the sidewalks and on the streets, uh, other than sort of just normal work traffic and things like that. And um, but it's but it's it's actually been quite interesting to be here for the last twenty four hours and see um see signs of life let's say quite a bit of quite a bit of that all right and regarding the news up there at the very top uh, to, uh while we're sort of worried about not people out there which they should but in that circumstance here when trump uh said protest 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 and uh you must have helped, Matt, that no one showed. That's great when we don't have people <laughs> out there. <laughs> For that purpose, at least, yes. So, and I guess speaking of national politics, we got the polls up there, at least from last night. I double checked, I think it's still the same. While we're really happy uh, to have the Senate secured as blue, and not that we could have hoped any different, but uh, the House might, there's only one more win away to keep it red, which is sad. But uh, we don't want this to overshadow our enthusiasm about Josh Green. We haven't really, we were still under the impact of all of that. So I don't think, at least for myself, we haven't sufficiently showed enthusiasm and, and appreciation and congratulations. So I will do this here from my side. Josh, uh, thanks for being with us and, and working with us on all the levels, because that's what it takes. And the sort of the one we remember uh, the most and being engaged in the uh, matters of uh, the built environment, Eric, if we can get the show quote up from the very top right, and to whom do these sexy legs belong that we otherwise don't see the body going with it? <laughs> well, the uh, sexy skinny legs, uh, sexiness is uh, questionable, belong to me. And I am sitting next to Neil Abercrombie. And uh, we were both at one of your class, uh, I don't know what you would want to call that, not critiques necessarily, but in which the students pretend, uh, present the aspects of the different things that they worked on during the semester. And we got to react that time to the various thoughts that they were coming up with for developing things for the future. And there are a number of uh, things that uh, not only did they come up with, but under the guidance of their teacher, who is Martin Despang, they think outside the box and they use their young imaginations and young thoughts to 
break away from everything that's already been established and try to think of new ways to uh, build things for people to live in. And that's what Neil was reacting to. And that's what I was a part of as well. And I'm going to be doing that again fairly soon for uh, your class. And so I'll be looking forward to that. Thanks for confirming this way. (laughs) Thank you. Hey, and Matt, since uh, we shared that you were just talking with a national German government and their sort of diplomatic branches, and speaking of informed clients and informed citizens, we talked before the show, uh, Neil's qualification that impressed you. You want to reiterate that? Maybe. Oh, right. Uh, th- th- he studied uh, urban policy and planning or something along that, those lines. Ex- exactly. Um, and sorry that the show quote in the picture is a little bit blurry, but what he holds in his hand is his what he had his PhD thesis based upon, which is Lewis Mumford's Wither Honolulu. And he came with that and he said, I'm prepared. <laughs> and, a, and a little anecdote from this from the emerging generation aside, uh, as you were referring to DeSoto, is that one of the team members, Dustin Solars, who makes because we charge them too much tuition and fees, so they got to make a living somehow. And Dustin is making kitchens uh, near the airport. And he told me he basically, this was the first year of jungleism in Waikiki in 2015. That's how time flies by. And uh, Neil was running uh, from 10 till 14. So he happened to be a kitchen customer of Dustin. And Dustin told us that when he came, Dustin was so excited about the project that he showed him the model. And that got Mrs. and Mr. Abercrombie totally excited about discussing what one should have done and could have done mm-hmm. and and so on and so we said that's be- the best uh you know peer assessment you can get if uh the highest politicians get engaged and get excited about it right so emerging generation keep on rocking and rolling this direction <laughs> right and uh get to the next slide so i uh should have been actually you want to be with us thank you i should have been with you in your front yard that we see at the bottom right because you had a premiere of a movie and did you have the chance to watch it or hear about it? And we we see it down there at the bottom left. No, I did not. I certainly know the setting very well, which, and just as an aside, uh, Bishop Museum has this great advantage of what we call the Great Lawn, which today is a very large open space in urban Honolulu today which is used for all kinds of different events, including, as you experienced, a movie showing. And that is something which is we're extremely fortunate to have. We could never replicate it now with the amount of money that it would cost to have this big open space in Honolulu. So that's just me plugging something that Bishop Museum has as its legacy, which is irreplaceable. Yeah, and, and thanks to you having that, because the legacy of drive-in, drive-in movie theaters, which is as American as you can get it, you lost. There isn't any left anymore. And uh, Matt, I don't know if your next time you go to Munich, please go <laughs> to see in the distance your uh, founding father's, Günther's premier project of the Olympics in 72, and the tower next to it, the needle-like mm-hmm. tower, you see it in the distance when you're in the movie uh, drive through movie theater in Aschheim. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the irony is it comes from here, it's gone here, and over there it exists. As we were talking, same with the mo- utmost tiki restaurant and bar is in the <laughs> basement of the most upscale hotel, the Bayerische Hof. Not anymore, although I was back to La Mariana and it's getting back up on its feet, so it's good to oh, have, yeah. but it's... It's the only one left, right? Yep, so that's right. We, we ironically had, because on Thursday when it was, I have to, which I don't have to, but I'm happy to coach uh, the evening, so I couldn't go. So we had to actually go to the Ward Consolidated Theater. And I left uh, with the taste of like, okay, I feel really, really guilty of my skin because the the movie portrays what we with our skin I have done to you local guys at the Soto. And so that's um, really, really hardening and heartbreaking. And uh, getting us to the next slide. Um, 
we, uh, you just sort of, I think you charged us last time because we were talking about Kakaako and our Kakaako. You said, well, we will have to see how that, you know, goes on in the future. And so Sammy and I went. And one of the things they said, I, we don't have to go back, but you must have read, you know, sugar cane and bracket blame. One of the locals uh, were saying in the movie, okay, that's all they do, you know, to rake in the money, uh, cash crop. And um, so um, we were thinking by going through Kakaako and top left is uh, showing you met uh, with Bill uh, and <laughs> Sammy uh, taking you out to what's it called? Tango, right? Um, and and Bundit was the facilitator of that one. So thank you for that. So we know how that part of Kakaako looks like, and that is still Howard Hughes. So these Howley Cowboys. But <laughs> the ones below that one is our Kakaako, where which is really, you know, I think the best is actually the graffiti. And the graffiti is local artist, and they are kind of eye winking and um uh, they, they, they deal, I think, in one way or another one with local culture, while what you see on the right behind the PI mobile that Sammy proudly poses himself in front of is the collection, which is one of the first high rises by Kamehameha School. And that one in our discussion we had was like, well, that's cash crop too. That's cash crop architecture where you basically do it for profit. And it's a little bit as, you know, Matt and I, when we were talking before the show, it's like, well, you grow a pineapple and then you cut it in, in, in chunks and you give like two pieces to the local people and the rest you ship out for profit, right? That's how it feels a little bit, at least to us after this discussion, uh, you know, yeah. in, in that, if that's fair to say. Yeah, right? and uh, I think the thing that also comes up in this situation, which is somewhat unplanned and maybe a little peripheral, but it's very valid. Matt, you were just talking about there being street life and, and activity on the streets in Detroit coming back from desolation and how heartening that is. And I think one of the things that's really going to change in Kaka'ako is and is changing. Kaka'ako developed as first a residential area with schools, with a movie theater, et cetera. Gradually, it mm -hmm. became light industrial, and the inhabitants or the residents moved out. But even though that character changed, it was still then and still for a large part is a very discombobulated, if you will, amalgamation of lots of different types of buildings, small buildings, walkable streets, Etc. Now, there is the lack of infrastructure, which is a hindrance in some situations where the utilities are not underground and there are no sidewalks, etc. But this hodgepodge of diverse buildings of different sizes and shapes, the multitude of street art on the walls, the murals which have been created for powwow, that very disconnection adds a liveliness and a vitality which these mega projects, when they are taking up an entire block with a uniform structure, which is usually the parking plinth, then destroys. So it is a very different feeling. Yeah. And that is something that Kaka'ako is going to turn into and is in the process of turning into. So what you see in the pictures of the vitality is going to change to a much more sterile, separate, and monolithic group of buildings, which is going to be very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to that regards, the top left picture is the most vital, and that is what they call salt, and that is actually a repurposed area where they afforded and allowed themselves, spoiled themselves, I guess, in the pressure of development and going high, uh, not this one, because that's the Howard Howley Uzi one, but the very bottom left, Eric, that's that salt area. So these are good. Good you showed that one before, because that's like the what the Howleys do. And then you see bottom left what the locals do. And that, in fact, is very, but also because it is a grown urban fabric and it's some greediness to it, right? It's not all lean and clean and new. So upon your request to Soto, but you're, you're sitting already, so we don't have to worry too much that you're <laughs> dropping. Uh, but next slide is the answer to your question that see how that will develop. 
So this is what Kamehameha School has out there on their website as far as what the future their master planning is. And again, uh, there is um, you know a lot of um, wording up there, which is actually the the project that will be the the first one to actually be executed. And uh, before we leave this picture here, we want to read through this. But before that, again, uh, Matt, we've been um, talking about the traditional hand drawing style of the Banish firm uh, that it was famous for, rightly so. But the difference is then. It actually translates through through the kind of a charming chaos and reality, I would like to call it, which you can call people, you know, um, basically powered. That's like where, you know, you know, things get alive. And so you carry this all the way through while here, I think it's a scam. They want to get across. Oh, it's harmless. It's kind of cute because, you know, we drew it by hand. Mm. But in fact, when we analyze this more, guys, where do we get to? What's our assessment of what we see? Let's well, get it as going. Yeah, I just, I just want to say that when you mention salt, salt at our Kaka'ako is successful, and I really admire it. But when you create things like this, it is not possible to know beforehand if people are actually going to come use it and turn it into a space of vitality and human activity and salt has been successful which i really admire when you go there there are lots of people walking around they're doing stuff that's great the rendering that we're looking at here makes this place look lively and exciting and wonderful but the proof is going to be when it's built and you can't force people to come to something they have to want to come and once they come they attract more people. We're very social. We like to go where there's activity. So I hope that this will occur successfully. But again, you cannot be 100% sure that that's going to happen, even if you well, draw a nice rendering. Let's say the rendering is well intended, but are there clues from reality why this might not work the way it's suggested? Matt? I mean, it, it's it is a good question. I mean, just because you draw people in the in the image doesn't mean there's anything there that actually brought them there, right? I mean, this is and this is of course the archi one of the architect's great great tricks is to be able to sort of, but and and it is it's it's sort of invisible forces, right? Things you can't can't necessarily draw that play a big role in how as as Desoto said, how attractive or how appealing uh, a place is. I think. You know, any kind of development of this scale also brings to brings to 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 question the kind of it, it almost by its sheer size implies a kind of demographic shift, right? Like mm -hmm. who is actually going to be renting these places and how is that going to change the inherent uh composition of 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 who who goes there and who lives there and and, and occupies that place. Yeah, I have to say, and this is exciting. Uh, I yet have to, you have to show me your projects, which I haven't seen basically in America, right? But the ones of your firm, as in my hometown, uh, the North LB and the big town over Hamburg, the Unilever building. Mm -hmm. You guys were programming, you, you didn't leave it up to here. It's like, okay, these tenants here got to really pull people, right? So it relies on if there's good, you know, restaurants and good shops. If not, people don't go there. So you, you mm -hmm. as an architect, always showed in in very sort of private, very exclusive typologies of a bank, and of a corporate headquarters, which by their nature have nothing to do with the public. But you say mm -hmm. if it's in a city, it has to be, and you made sure, and your your architecture sets the stage for that because we know what people like and what they don't like. So it's not rocket science to script that, right? And that's what you did. There's a great restaurant at the end, at the backside of the Unilever building, uh, right at the river. And mm -hmm. we know that people like to be on the river and they like to eat. So, you know, and that draws them. And there's there's public shops and you don't see the, the best is that, of course, there's, there's security of, you know, that the, not everyone is supposed to walk up into the corporate headquarters. And that's mm -hmm. solved in such a discreet way, just like before Günther did it with the with the Bundestag, right? Where 
you don't have to basically barricade things off and scare people, right? You can make it very discreet, non-visible, and basically be, give people the feeling, oh, this is a public building, although it's not. That's really well, and I think you, when, yeah, Unilever does it in a it does it in a similar way to the Genzyme building that we looked at last week, in that it puts the lobby of the office building at the second floor with a big stair going up. So it's not hidden. I mean, anybody who goes there to do business with that company knows via this kind of generous stair that goes up in the open in the in the security or the kind of registration desk that sits there that that's where they should go. But the ground plane through the entire building is given over to the public. Anybody can walk through either one of those buildings at the ground level and actually be in the atrium, which is kind of a special thing, right? Not too many office buildings or corporate buildings actually let you do that. Exactly. And as we will see again, because sorry for the too long weekly architectural criticism together here, but that needs to be done. But we get back to the Gensan building and keep that thought and we will see it again. I will just say there is, what we all know is that being out in the sun is uncomfortable. The palm trees rendered here predominantly don't give much shade. We don't see the umbrellas that we just saw in the previous image <laughs> uh, at salt. And we see this concealed surface that radiates back. The only you know, comfortable people are the two guys or people under the tree to the right, right? So, I mean, th yeah. that's why I'm saying this image here is basically fooling us because under real conditions, this is not. And now we get to the architecture that is sort of like, you know, nicely not, you know, gone into more details, but you already get clues because, you know, there is uh, very few horizontal uh, double or multiple lines, which might indicate uh, balconies. Don't even want to go and call it lanai's yet. And mm -hmm. so, uh, okay, leave even less uh, sort of doubt, go to the next slide. <laughs> So this is now when the computer kicks in and uh, Kamehameha School tells us the answer to your question, DeSoto, uh, how is the future of SALT going to look like? Here yeah. We go. yeah, and and I think one of the things, you know, Martin, you come from a European tradition where there are town squares and in some cities in Europe, there are immense plazas and South America as well, which which come from a European tradition. We don't here in Honolulu have those immense plazas. Now, the immensity and the view plane in one sense can be very uplifting and exciting because the sheer space is so big. But at the same time, you don't want to linger because as you just pointed out, there's no shade, it is paved. You may cross it on your way to something, but you're not going to just stand there. It's not likely unless you're looking at the view. So. What SALT has is a lot of smaller, more intimate spaces where you're not overwhelmed and you are protected. You can be in the shade, you can gather. Really big spaces may look impressive and they may be uplifting to gaze upon, but you don't necessarily want to go and live there and spend a lot of time there. So what I'm looking at in this view here is a huge boulevard with an open space right in the center that people are crossing in diagonal, you know, uh, red light situation. But mm -hmm. even though there are trees, it is not looking like you want to be there for any length of time. Well, where you want to be is, I see some blue up there horizontally. There is some pool there. Yeah, but you but don't get to go only, there. That's only yeah. the people who own there or rent in there, right? So that's <laughs> not what you've been talking about, Matt, where you make the private public or, you know, uh, the, you make it inclusive. This is, this is highly exclusive. And, uh, and you, got, you got the same old, we're in the, we're in the 21st century, way into, and Matt, you said when you left us, you said, wouldn't this be the island with basically mainly electric cars, because this is the best circumstance. But I want to go, we discussed, we have been dedicating many shows to that, to Soto, and we show quotes, you know, one with two uh, up there to the right. If we find, because we got the most ideal circumstances, not only for renewable energy, which would fuel electric cars, um, but also basically for uh, public transportation of multimodal way, as you know, 
moving bands and gondolas and all that stuff that even works in winter resorts. But, you know, when you don't have the snow, we remember, you know, we got the job for the canopy for the subway in Bochum because it always snows on and it, it goes kaput. And that's why they could save some money. You don't have this here. So really for continuing the 21st century, potentially post-fossil and multimodal, uh, really uh, wasting the parking, the, 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 the first couple of floors to that fossil dinosaur. I mean, or even if you say it's a post-fossil, but to that very inefficient and ineffective chunk that clogs the streets because it's not gonna be less traffic jams and congestion with electric cars, right? It's solving the air is more breathable and there isn't as much oil on the roads, but the rest of the problems basically stay, right? And that's, uh, yeah, so this yeah. this isn't very encouraging and um, we have to go more into the uh, architectural detail also because the first of these projects that they basically told us is going to be up is the one that we see at the, uh, the left in the in the in the very back of that new stuff here in the left and for that one eric we have to go back forward to the previous slide and quickly read through the project description here and that needs you to soda because once again they're using hawaiian birdage yes. here yes yes Right. Workforce, yes, workforce and affordable housing. The mm -hmm. Kahuina mixed use project will include two residential towers, a 43 story tower named Lamaku, meaning large standing torch, is uh, planned to offer up to 120 units of workforce for sale housing in addition to 329 market for sale units. Addition uh, adjacent to 32 story is called Mamalu and like, oh, oh, and honoring the legacy of Princess. Victoria Kamamalu will feature 125 units of affordable rental housing, 273 uh, ground floor commercial space, nine story, 3000 stall parking lot, garage, 12 little work lofts, open air gathering places. Okay, so yeah, some some really big, uh, really big towers and a huge parking area. Yeah, and we want towards you more than with this torch that we're going to show you at the beginning of next week's show. But I promise, promise, promise that we not <laughs> we skip on our weekly because I'm sure there's going to be a new project popping up that we skip. So we only show you that one on one slide to then bring the hope uh, up high again and reconvene with the all inclusive, easy breezy in its way, as much as it can be in temperate climate, Gensheim building. So <laughs> until then, please have a good week, guys, and everyone else, and see you next week for that. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.